An allochromatic mineral is like a like a chicken breast, or like tofu. It doesn't I'd have. I love to hear it where doesn't, you're going with it, well, it, On its own, in its pure form, it doesn't have a ton of flavor, and it gets its flavor from seasonings or and color. spices and stuff. Fluoride is <laughs> kind of the tofu of the gym world. Yeah. It just kind of will take on any flavor, really, and it's completely colorless, which is the theme of today's episode. Rebecca, I was taken a, a once over on our channel. We've unboxed red gemstones. Mm -hmm. We've unboxed blue gemstones, green gemstones, yellow, orange even. You know what we haven't unboxed? Tell me. Colorless gemstones. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the first thing that stood out to me was it's extreme. Strong double refraction. Double refraction. And this specimen is calcite. Calcite comes in a variety of forms. This is what we would call a dog tooth. Calcite is known for that double refractiveness that Rebecca was just mentioning. Most gemstones are doubly refractive, but most of those gemstones, you cannot see it without you know, some sort of magnification or a special tool to detect it. But calcite is so strongly doubly refractive that I can literally hold my finger behind the crystal and you can see that there's two of them. There's My fingertip has two edges, which is crazy. Double refraction basically describes when a single beam of light enters a material, like calcite, and it takes that one beam and it splits into two. That's why you see two images of my finger instead of one, because two beams are hitting your eye. And you can measure that degree of splitting and it can vary even within a gemstone. And so calcite has a huge difference in the highest and lowest angle of splitting. And so gotcha. what you have there is what's called birefringence, which it affects, again, this very extreme double refraction. Because of this really unique optical property that calcite has, there are uses that are outside just aesthetic. When you have this really pure, transparent, colorless calcite, it's a variety called Iceland spar. In gemology, for example, Iceland spar is used in dichroscopes. It's said, or it's at least theorized, that early navigators would use this kind of material to detect the position of the sun on like cloudy or overcast days, which I think is really cool. So of course that's Iceland spar, which is one <laughs> variety of calcite. This is not Iceland spar, but it's still pretty transparent. And again, mm -hmm. it is it is colorless with maybe a, a little bit of brownish coloring, but of course calcite can be a lot of different colors. Mm -hmm. You most often see it in like this yellowish, yeah, kind of or an earthy orangish, yellow. yeah, earthy color. But you also often see it in this colorless. Let's just quickly talk about how gemstones get their colors. Sure. So there are multiple ways. Some are more common than others. So you have a chemical composition for all gemstones, and you have impurities that create different colors. You can have different atomic placements yeah. that create different colors. So fluorite is a good example of yeah. that. You know, in diamonds, you have the band gap theory. One of the more common ways of coloring gemstones is by dispersed metal ions. So you have these different elements with ionic charges mm -hmm. that enter into a chemical composition and create different types of color. So we see that a lot with like barrels and corundums gotcha. and some of the more popular gemstones, that's typically how they're, they get their colors. Yeah, so all of the gemstones that we're gonna look at today are in their pure form. They're all colorless. You wanna do another box? Yeah, let's do it. Nice. Ooh, okay. These are colorless fasted stones and colorless stones without any equipment, that can be a gemologist nightmare. So our team told us what these are. These are Phenakite. It's a neosilicate material. It's actually relatively hard. It's about seven and a half or an eight on the most scale of hardness. So not a bad material to have around. Mm -hmm. It can have a pretty high brilliance. Yeah, I was catching the, a little bit of it, which means it's it's a pretty decent diamond imitator. Yes. Usually you see it as a mineral specimen, but here we have it faceted. And these are actually for sale. Oh. We'll put the links in the description. I think that these are really beautiful gemstones. They are, and they're exceptionally clear. Yes, absolutely I don't vacant. see any hint of any other colors in there. So phenakite gets commonly confused with rock crystal quartz, which is the colorless variety of quartz. I can see that. Sure. That was actually one of my first thoughts there because of its brilliance, its amount of 
luster. And so um, that makes sense to me because usually phenakite, of course it can be colorless, but it's often like a grayish, a bluish. It can mm -hmm. have sometimes a pinkish reddish. So it can have other colors for sure. And actually phenakite gets its name from the ancient Greek word for deceive. So kind of a look alike. They done been node for a while. <laughs> so the price on these range from about $80 to a little under $250. And so you have gemstones that are pretty large, pretty clean, colorless, of course, really beautiful, that are great intro collector stones. Yeah. Because they have several price points, you know, some under $100 and you have an interesting gemstone that not everyone knows about. Yeah, they're really unique, that's for sure. But they can be expensive. Yeah, you wanna talk about price points. The largest phenakite ever found was actually just discovered in Sri Lanka in November of 2021. 616.9 carats. Oh my gosh. Five million dollars. Oh. <laughs> so, makes these look cheap, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> I really love those. Okay, next box. On to the next. Woo! Woo. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I love, okay, we've shown this one a few times. I love this guy. This is one of my favorite specimens that we have. And you might be wondering, why is that? It looks dull and boring. Look at that. It's like a pool of topaz. Uh-huh. Just completely clean. The outside's rough, but then you've got this cross section that just, like you're just peering all the way to the back of it. So Topaz is known for its perfect basal cleavage. And so my guess is that is on a cleavage plane because it's a very, very flat break. It is, but you can see some of the ridges across that cleavage plane, which tells me that this is not polished and cut. It cleaved that way naturally. It's so cool. And you just look straight to the back and it's completely colorless, which is the theme of today's episode. So what we're looking at here is pure topaz. It's like, you know, one of those really clean blocks of ice that they've only just cut and they haven't quite shaved yeah. off the edges yet. But that's, it's just straight, it's topaz all the way down. So topaz is an aluminum silicate with fluorine and in its purest state is colorless. And when you add impurities or it, sometimes it can be defects in the crystal structure, mm -hmm. you get color. So again, we have, you know, blues, reds, those yellow oranges, kind of pinks, but you also see topaz commonly treated, especially yeah. with like coating and irradiation. Mm -hmm. And that's how it can get the color as well, which again, the treatment affects its crystal structure. Right. So what you have here is pure Straight topaz. topaz. Next box. Whoa, oh, get on demand. <gasps> Yo, that's ginormous. Yeah, these Look are the large. Look at the size of him. I think fluorite. I do see a slight bit of blue, so I'm gonna ask if this is maybe colorless barrel. Oh, this is Goshenite, which is the colorless member of the barrel family. Okay, so barrels, beryllium, aluminum, silicates. So we talked before about this channel, the definition of allochromatic and idiochromatic. Mm -hmm. So chrome meaning color. Allochromatic means that it is colored by elements not part of its base chemical composition. Right. Idiochromatic, it's colored by elements in its chemical composition. So it's self coloring, so to speak. Barrels are allochromatic gemstones. So they're beryllium aluminum silicates and different barrels are aquamarine, heliodor, emerald, morganite. So we've got chromium, iron, titanium. Those are some of the elements that color barrels. In goshenite, it's pure beryllium aluminum silicate. But I do have to say, I do think that Goshenite does have a little bit of iron or titanium in there because I do see some slight blue, but it's definitely not enough to call it an aquamarine. No, not even close. Now this one I've got, you know, I can actually tell by when you feel it on the edge, it's, it's pretty hard. I'm gonna say that that is actually colorless corundum. I'm a lot less worried about dropping it now. Yeah, now yeah. So corundum is a nine on the most scale of hardness and definitely not definitive in terms of touching its Ooh, girdle, corundum. but it's sharp. You probably open a can so with that, that thing. That was a decent guess, but corundum is the family that sapphires and rubies mm -hmm. are part of. So corundums are aluminum silicates and all corundum that aren't red are sapphire. So mm -hmm. you have blue corundum, that's blue sapphire, pink corundum, yellow corundum. Would we call this white sapphire then? 
or colorless sapphire? I would call it colorless sapphire. And it's that pretty. one I do think does have just a hint of blue to it. Corundum is an allochromatic gemstone, and so you're gonna have impurities that cause colors. Iron and titanium color it blue. Yellows come from some iron. Reds are colored by chromium. And colorless, of course, it's, it doesn't have any impurities in high enough quantities to create a significant amount of color. So I see a little orange inclusion of something right here on the edge near the girdle, if you look at it from the back. But then tell me, am I tripping? Is there like a little wash of yellow? I definitely like see Like there's it. a little stroke of yellow in yes. there? Yes. If I had to guess, it's a reflection of that orange. That was what I was thinking as well. Yeah. Other than that, colorless. So because this is corundum and this is barrel, this one is a couple thousand dollars more expensive than this larger gemstone, which might seem counterintuitive, but you know, it comes down to the material very often, not just the carat weight. And often the difference in price with these two gems in particular is color. You don't have color it's going true. on there. It's true. So the colorless varieties have vastly different price points, but honestly, both are really pretty and unique mm -hmm. for their own reasons, and I really like both. I actually, in a lot of ways, really love this one. It's got a rounder, softer overall appearance, whereas this one, not only is the girdle quite sharp, but it comes down to a serious point down there at the, at the tip. There's kind of an intensity to this one. And again, if you're interested in any of the faceted pieces that we're showing you today, they're all available for sale on our storefront, mm -hmm. gemstones.com, on Jadora, and we'll put the links in the description so you can check those out because, again, what we were saying earlier, with colorless gemstones, it's really fun to have a variety of options and hopefully yeah. you guys are seeing already so far in the episode how many different colorless gemstones there are. Okay, let's see more. Cool, yeah. Bigger box. Box. Oh my gosh. Check that out. I okay. think I guessed a little early on the last box when I said fluorite. Oh, because yeah, these are no, giving no. cubic. No, you're totally right. I know. Wow, these are really clear. Okay, so the team gave us a very nice hint of including rough specimens here. Yeah. Because you can see, that so helps. fluorite is in the cubic crystal system. Mm -hmm. It has four planes of perfect cleavage, mm -hmm. and you can see these cleavage planes on what probably used to be a cube at some point. Yeah. It's so it's similar to the topaz. I'll try and show it again where if we can get the light to reflect off of the topaz and off the fluorite, you can see in both of them, this cleavage plane, it's not polished, it's not cut, it's rough, it just, it because of its atomic structure, it breaks in certain patterns. And for fluorite, it's four planes, and it just, it wants to cleave. And again, it cleaves naturally in a cube, or in an octahedron, or an octahedron yeah. which is an outward display of its crystal system and its crystal structure. That's a great way of putting it, yeah. Fluorite is one of my favorite just minerals of, of all of them. Love um, fluorite. The only thing wrong with it is its relative softness of a four on the Mohs scale of hardness. So it's a little bit tough to incorporate into jewelry, which is a shame because fluorite is allochromatic. It's colorless when it's pure. So it's calcium fluoride which is where it gets its name. So again, fluorite is colored by a variety of mechanisms. You can have fluorite colored by impurities, you can have fluorite colored by color centers where the ions replace mm -hmm. atoms in certain crystal structures. If you think of fluorite, you might think of a few different colors. So purple fluorite is what most people probably think of. Yeah, the fact that fluorite can and wants to be all these different colors makes colorless specimens even more interesting. An allochromatic mineral is like a like a chicken breast or like tofu. It doesn't have I love have, to hear it where doesn't, you're going with it, well, it, in its own on its own in its pure form it doesn't have a ton of flavor and it gets its flavor from seasonings and spices and stuff. Fluoride is kind of the tofu of the gym world. Yeah. It just kind of will take on any flavor really. Yeah. And it's square. Ready for the next box? Yeah, let's do it. All right. New box. Ooh, okay. Oh, hello. Interesting cut. So it's like a shield cut. Oh, this one's not even a, a triangle. Cushion. It's like a, it's got swoops. This one's a nice little cushion. So this one has a lot of inclusions. Yeah. They're subtle because they're colorless inclusions and they almost remind me of like pinpoints on diamonds, but it's kind of speckled throughout. See all that? Yeah, check it. Yeah, it's full of stuff. 
So this is magnesite. Okay. I get a little bit of brilliance, a little bit of fire from some of these facets. Actually, yeah, a little blast of red. I like it. This is actually a member of the calcite group. Okay. Like fluorite, it's impressive that this is faceted at all because it has three planes of perfect cleavage. But like calcite, it's not very hard either. I've got a different one. I've got beryllinite. Okay. So this has beryllium in its chemical composition, and beryllium as part of a gemstone is actually relatively rare compared to a lot of sure, the other gems. Yeah. So, you know, you have a lot of silicon, oxygen, aluminum, iron. Beryllium is a rarer element, and so to have it in a gemstone can create a bunch of really cool properties. It's mainly found in Maine, so here in the U.S., which is really fun. It's often pretty included, which makes sense based off of the gem that we see here. It's not that the inclusions are that visible from like a contrast perspective, because again, they're, they're kind of yeah, colorless. It's all kind of but they are definitely visible with the naked eye, which makes it really cool. About five and a half to six on the most scale of hardness. And it's just another one of those gems that is more niche that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah. And it's a great collector's item, especially if you're looking for gems from the US. Of the gemstones named for their beryllium content, this is probably the least famous. So actually, beryllinite is relatively new from a naming perspective. It was named in the late 1800s, which might not sound that new to you, but from a gemstone perspective, a lot of these stones had yeah. names well before the mm -hmm. 19th, 20th, 21st centuries. All right, next box. <laughs> we Whee! should get a box, Rob. Oh, great, sharing. It's caring. All right. Okay, so we actually have two different gems. I've got okay. Danbury. This is another U.S. gemstone. Okay. It was named after Danbury, Connecticut, so again in the Northeast. It's about a seven on the most scale of hardness, so you know it's not a corundum or a diamond, but it's not a fluorite, so you can wear it in yeah. everyday types of jewelry items. Danbury is known for its excellent transparency and clarity, and you can see here in both of these, there really are no eye visible inclusions, really nice colorless color. As opposed to a lot of the other stones on this table, which we more commonly see in their colored form, Danbright is actually more often colorless. And it's known for its thermoluminescence. So thermo meaning heat, luminescence meaning light. Yeah. And so it can display red when subjected to heat, which is really cool. These are for sale too. So if you buy one of these, you can test that out and let us know how it yeah. goes. So this is Polisite. Cool thing about Polisite, I love names and where the gems get their names. Polisite is named after this mythological figure named Pollux, who was one of two twin half-brothers, Pollux and Castor. And the reason that they named Polisite after Pollux is because it often forms an association with Petalite, which used to be called Castorite, after oh. the other twin. So they form together so they I have the that. twins' names. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it doesn't occur very many places in the world. 82% of the world's polysite reserves are all in Canada near a specific lake, Lake Burnick. So well-formed crystals of polysite are very rare, which is what makes these two cut stones so interesting. And also, polysite is usually used for industry. Polysite is a very significant ore of cesium. Okay. Yeah, so most of it doesn't get faceted. So the rough stuff is not for sale, but the faceted stuff is all for sale, everything that we went over today. All of the links will be down in the description if you want to check those out. I think they might be interesting to look at just like the varying pricing because none of these are going to be priced based on like raw color, right? They're all colorless. It's going to more be dictated by the material that it yeah. is. So Rebecca, it's that time of the episode where we have to select something to take a closer look of. Okay, I'm going to take something from your side. Okay, that's great because I was, I'm gonna take something from your side. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna take the colorless you barrel. You do like the barrel. I do, I love barrels. It's one of my favorite families of gemstones. I personally think the colorless variety is really fun. So, I've, I've got the gauche knight. Okay, I'm gonna snag this Iceland Spar variety calcite. It is truly spectacular to look at. I love the cut job on it as well. This extra cut near all the edges kind of gives it a sort of alien future tech sort of look. And I want you guys to really get a good look at the double refractiveness of calcite. So let's take a closer look.
thank you for joining me on this episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I especially hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching.